All right, so welcome to today's class about the Civil War home front. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of the Civil War on civilians, in part because the Civil War is a very important time period in American history. Um, but oftentimes what we focus on are things like battles and military history. Uh, probably more pages have been written on the Battle of Gettysburg than any other uh, event in American history. Uh, so what oftentimes gets lost in the shuffle is what the experience of the Civil War was like for those living at home, um, those who were not uh, enlisted uh, and fought in the war. Um, part of part of this is when we talk about war, the tendency is to talk about battles and campaigns and other kinds of things, strategies, tactics. Um, but there's a more recent movement within the field of military history that focuses on the experience of, of war in general, both the, the individual experience, what people fighting the war went through, um, and the lasting impact of, of fighting, so things like PTSD and other kinds of uh, long-lasting impacts of warfare. Um, but there's also a desire to kind of understand how war impacts society. Um, and I definitely benefited from this sort of newer trend in military history. When I was an undergraduate student at Texas A&M, uh, the military history class I took was taught by a, a professor who was very much kind of on that wheelhouse. Let, let's look at the broader impact of war on society. Um, that's definitely shaped me as a historian. I'm a historian of World War II era, um, and I specialize in the home front on World War II. Uh, so talking about home fronts during war and the, the impact of war on, on everybody uh, is definitely something that is uh, close to my heart as a historian. So what I kind of wanted to do today was to talk about the Civil War um, on the home front, both in the North and the South, because the experience is going to be very different um, in some ways, uh, depending upon geographic region. Uh, in other ways, there you will see some commonalities, but remember the North and the South have very different economies, so that's going to be uh, one sort of big contributor uh, for <clears throat> differences at home. Uh, and before we kind of get to the north, one of the things I want to bring your attention to is when you're reading your textbook, when you're watching materials about the Civil War, the Civil War is a huge pivot point for the United States. Um, some scholars nickname the Civil War and Reconstruction period the Second American Revolution because it drastically changes American society. Uh, we're going to talk next week about the impact of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the Constitution that are passed at the end and just after the Civil War uh, and how radically they change uh, the United States. So there's more substantial change in American society brought by the Civil War than there was from the American Revolution. And we're also going to finally settle that question of the balance of power between uh, the federal government and the state level governments as a result of the war. And the United States coming out of the Civil War is going to be in some ways more unified uh, than the United States that came out of the American Revolution. That being said, we still see distinctive regional differences today, uh, and we're going to see that during the Civil War as well. So let's talk a little bit about the home front in the North first, or the Union. So remember, during the Civil War, just to kind of recap, I know you guys have been reading uh, your textbook, for, but for those of you who maybe are watching this before you finished reading your textbook, the Civil War takes place between 1861 and 1865. The two sides of the American Civil War are the North or the Union, those fighting to preserve uh, the Union of the United States, and then the South or the Confederate States of America, the Confederacy, which is had broken away from the United States, from the Union, formed their own rival nation, uh, and basically did that to preserve slavery. So um, that's going to be something we talk a little bit more about uh, next week, the, the specter of slavery looming over the Civil War and Reconstruction. All right, so let's talk about the North, aka the Union. So one of the dangers 
when you're going to war in a nation that has a representative form of government, in other words, elements of democracy, right? Certain civil liberties like freedom of speech and press and assembly. One of the dangers when you go to war is that war doesn't tend to encourage things like freedom of speech or freedom of the press. Um, war tends to try to clamp down on societal freedoms in the name of more effectively fighting the war. And that's definitely something that earlier presidents were very concerned about. Uh, for example, James Madison during the War of 1812, right, was, was very concerned about the potential impact that war might have on a republic, particularly doing things like raising taxes and large standing armies and curtailing civil liberties. Um, during the War of 1812, that wasn't so much a problem, but we are going to see uh, some crackdown on civil liberties, some curtailing of civil liberties uh, during the Civil War in both the North and the South. So this was not a unfounded concern uh, from former President James Madison. So what ends up happening during the Civil War is we have a uh, sort of return to an earlier era of politics. Remember John Adams when he was president, the Alien and Sedition Acts that cracked down on press, that cracked down on free speech uh, in the name of sort of containing uh, a, a political party in dissent. We're gonna see that same kind of thing happen here um, where dissent against the dominant political party in the North, in this case, the Republican party at the time, uh, was seen as borderline treasonous. In other words, if you were going to criticize the, the ruling party, the Republicans in the North, a lot of people saw that as being equivalent to criticizing the Union cause in the Civil War. So even though Lincoln and Congress during the Civil War are not going to pass a, a new version of the Sedition Act and formally crack down on free speech, there is definitely a risk uh, for you uh, if you speak out. Um, harshly against uh, Republicans or against Lincoln's administration, um, a risk uh, both of, of kind of being watched more by the government, but also a, a sort of societal risk, right? We all have freedom of speech, but freedom of speech does not mean freedom of consequences uh, or from consequences of that speech, right? So you could say something and you're, you're inclined to say it, but people can think you're an asshole, for example. Um, the more sort of serious curtailing of civil liberties is the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Does anybody know what is the writ of habeas corpus? What does that mean? Do I have any CJ majors in here? Do you know what that right is? So the writ of habeas corpus means that you cannot hold someone indefinitely without formal charges. So if you're going to arrest someone, you can't just arrest them and chuck them into jail or prison and just let them sit there indefinitely. You have a certain period of time where you have to produce charges or let them go. So habeas corpus means to produce the body, right? So in other words, if you don't have charges leveled against them, you have to let them go. Um, so the suspension of writ of habeas corpus means that that timetable for you to put forth charges gets waved away so you can hold people indefinitely without being formally charged. And that's a huge violation of civil liberties. Um, this is not widely practiced. So in other words, even though they suspend it, they they don't just chuck people in prison or jail and leave them there uh, for long periods of time. But the potential threat is there, um, particularly for those folks who are arrested for making anti-war remarks. Um, most of the time, though, the writ of habeas corpus, when it is actually suspended and not just threatened to be suspended, uh, is for people who are accused of disloyalty uh, to the union, either um, in undermining the union's cause or in aligning themselves with the Confederacy. So people who'd be accused of things like espionage, for example. Uh, but this could also be a, a, a case of speech. Um, one prominent case is that of Clement Valdingham. 
uh, who was a civilian and a Democratic Party politician from Ohio. Uh, he was actually uh, arrested and put on trial in a military court for the crime of treason. He was found guilty by the military court of treason and exiled to the Confederacy. Okay. Um, what is the problem with a civilian being tried by a military court? The big problem with that is the fact that you have a right under the Constitution to be tried by a jury of your peers, meaning if you're a civilian, your case needs to be tried in civil court, not military court. Uh, and basically, the Supreme Court hears this uh, a series of cases like Valdingham's um, in Ex Part Milligan in 1866, where it says you cannot try civilians in military courts so long as there is a functioning civil court. So in other words, if you're in um, a place where uh, you're in a like a war-torn country, there's no functional civil court, military authority is the only kind of legal authority, then you could do it. But that doesn't describe the way the North was. The North uh, was never really occupied uh, by the Confederacy. So in other words, there was never need uh, to try civilians by military court. So that's going to be a big concern. Again, it could have been a lot worse. Um, thankfully, these cases tended to be rare. Um, but the fact that the writ of habeas corpus was suspended, the fact that civilians were being tried in military courts, even if it wasn't a, a widespread thing, is alarming uh, to safeguarding civil liberties. And we're going to see in later wars the United States is involved in, particularly World War I, if you take history 1302, um, we're going to see even further crackdown on civil liberties during wartime. Now, the North, before the Civil War, was already industrialized. Remember, we talked about the uh, Industrial Revolution and then the subsequent Market Revolution, right? The economic transformation of the United States had been centered already in the North. What's going to happen during the Civil War is that industrialization is going to escalate. It's going to ramp up. Uh, we're going to see increased mechanization or the use of machines uh, in factories. Um, particularly ones that produce clothing, ammunition, and that's going to fuel economic growth. Um, we're also going to see the impact of more machine usage in the agricultural sector. Uh, so mechanization, inventions like uh, uh, the mechanical reaper and other kinds of things uh, made it so that you could do farming on a more sort of industrial scale. Uh, and that is also going to be augmented by immigration, which still continues uh, into the North during the Civil War. So more machines and then immigrant labor replacing men who had been drafted uh, into the Northern uh, military is going to help boost agricultural production, uh, particularly in the West. There's also going to be a lot of government contracts which are driving industrial growth. Um, you need uniforms for your troop, you need ammunition, you need food. So there's gonna be a lot of government contracts going into private industry, contracting them for these sorts of supplies. And this is actually going to start to create the fortunes of the folks that we refer to in the Gilded Age in History 1302 as captains of industry, or if you're a little bit more cynical, robber barons. Um, so, for example, Andrew Carnegie, who eventually builds an iron and steel empire, John D. Rockefeller uh, in oil, Philip Armour in beef supply, Jay Gould and J.P. Morgan in finance. These guys are still relatively young men during the Civil War, and they're going to make their initial fortunes through government contracts during the war. And most of these guys, again, notice that they're young men. So technically, they should be subject to the draft, which said that men from a certain age, usually from like 18 to in the mid-30s, 
had to register for the draft, and if they were drafted, they had to serve. A lot of these guys, though, got through on a loophole in the draft, which was you could purchase a substitute. So if you got picked, if your name got picked in a draft, either you had to enlist or you could pay somebody to enlist in your place. So rich people did this all the time to get out of fighting. A lot of these guys, you know, who were running businesses did this so they wouldn't have to, you know, abandon their business and go fight. Um, one of my ancestors, who was relatively fresh off the boat from Germany, um, actually was uh, hired by a, a rich man to be his substitute and thus fought uh, for the Union Army during the Civil War. So that's going to be a source of, of contention uh, for some people in the North, uh, this notion that rich people, and in the South as well, this notion that rich people can essentially buy their way out of military service. Um, that's going to be a sticking point. We'll talk about that more shortly. There's also going to be uh, a focus on growing the economy, not just during the war, but also looking to the future, looking to after the war. Uh, Congress at this time doesn't have any Southern representatives. And for a long time, Northerners have been the ones to really push infrastructure development and government involvement in the economy, but the South had been the one pumping the brakes and going, no, we don't really want that. We don't want to support that. Now, however, now that we don't have the South in the Congress during the war, Congress passes a whole bunch of legislation designed to promote economic growth. Things like a higher tariff or a higher tax on imported products, the Homestead Act, uh, is a huge one. Um, even though, again, 1863 is smack dab in the middle of the war, Congress is looking forward, and the Homestead Act promises settlers 160 acres of land if they move out west and occupy that government-owned land and improve it, usually over a period of like five years. And at the end of that, that period of improvement, you got to own the land free and clear. You didn't have to pay for it out of your pocket. So long as you settled on government land, you lived there for the required minimum amount of time and you improved it in some way. So building like a farm or a ranch, it was yours, free and clear. Nearly a half a million families got land through the Homestead Act by the time the program ended in the 1930s. So obviously not a whole lot of people are going to be rushing uh, to take advantage of this while the war is going on. But after the Civil War, there's going to be a huge movement to the West by people who want to take advantage of this deal. There's also the Land Grant College Act. So Congress is like, OK, if we're going to be encouraging people to move out to the West, we probably need to connect that region um, and grow their economy and their society. So the Land Grant College Act is going to give states funding to establish agricultural and mechanical colleges. So agriculture and mechanical colleges focus mainly on what it sounds like, uh, fields related to agriculture and agricultural science, animal husbandry, and mechanical or engineering. So New Mexico State University uh, is one of these land grant colleges just up the road from us in El Paso. Uh, Texas A&M University, my alma mater, that's where the A&M comes from. It started as a land grant college. Okay, so um, every state you can find one of these land grant colleges pretty much. We also need to connect these uh, areas in the West, uh, particularly not just so people can get out there easily, but also so the economy can be plugged into other regions. So the Congress is going to issue charters to two companies, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific, to build a transcontinental railroad. Um, it's going to take them until 1869 to finish construction, um, but uh, that will be the first railroad that connects the West Coast to the East Coast of the United States. Part of the reason it takes so long is, um, in particular, the Central Pacific, which was the one that started in California, and then the Union Pacific started in Missouri, which was the previously the farthest west it went and worked towards each other. The Central Pacific had to dynamite their way through, uh, or should I just dynamite? 
This is right about the time Dynamite's invented. I can't remember if it's pre or post invention of Dynamite. Anyways, they had to get their way through the Sierra Nevada mountain range uh, in California, which took them quite some time uh, to be able to uh, work that out. So Congress is setting the scene for long-term economic growth, particularly in the West. They're also uh, embracing some new financial policies. For the first time, we have an income tax. Um, this was the first time anything in, like this had been attempted in U.S. history. Um, this will not be a permanent income tax yet. It's not until 1913 uh, that Congress makes our annual income taxes that we file every April uh, a required and permanent way to fund uh, the nation. Um, there's also a system of um, nationally chartered banks. We don't have that Bank of the United States we talked about in the era of Andrew Jackson anymore, but there are going to be certain banks kind of chosen to take over that sort of function, to hold government funds, to regulate other banks, and to issue currencies. Uh, greenbacks or paper money uh, are printed by the government for the first time during this time period. Previously, currency have been printed by individual banks, and so the notes function more like IOUs and that you could take it to the bank that issued it and exchange it for hard currency like gold or silver. Um, now we have paper money issued by the government um, and issued with certain valuation. This was done to sustain national debt during the war um, and that's going to cause inflation. <laughs> um, the national debt's going to balloon to two billion dollars. That's not adjusted in today's money. Two billion in 1860s money uh, because of the war, and that paper currency is going to be a way to kind of sustain the government. Uh, by the end of the war, the federal government increased in size. It became the largest employer in the United States, and the budget of the national government increased by 20 times over the course of the war. Um, so the government will shrink back down in peacetime, but the importance of the federal government and its expanded role in the economy is going to be a more permanent feature of American politics following uh, the Civil War. So uh, in the North, women on the home front had some new opportunities available to them. Because men were getting drafted uh, into the armed forces, this resulted in a shortage of, of manpower, right? We, we have all these workers being taken away uh, from their jobs, getting drafted. So more women are being hired in their place, working in factories, in retail, as government clerks, and also as nurses. And Clara Barton is probably the most famous example of a nurse during the Civil War. Um, most women worked uh, in a federal agency known as the Department of Female Nurses. Um, which was created to train, organize, and deploy uh, nurses to uh, the battlefront, to field hospitals. Clara Barton did so independently. Uh, she did not work at that department, but she does do a lot to uh, raise awareness uh, of nursing as a field for women. And Clara Barton is also going to be very deeply involved in bringing uh, the American Red Cross uh, to life, basing it on an international organization. Uh, she's also going to be influential in drafting uh, the Geneva Convention, uh, which basically is a convention that uh, comes up with basic rules for warfare, including things like you can't torture people, right? Um, that kind of, you have to have prisoners held in, in certain levels of conditions, right? Um, so that's going to come after the Civil War. So Clara Barton uh, is very much involved in trying to improve the experience, the ugly experience of warfare uh, through her efforts in highlighting nursing, bringing the American Red Cross, a relief organization into existence and with the Geneva Convention. And by the way, she's also a feminist too. Uh, she also advocated for women to get the right to vote. Most women are not necessarily going to have new jobs outside the home or go into battlefield nursing. Most women are going to participate in the war by supporting relief efforts. Uh, so, for example, the United States Sanitary Commission um, was a national level organization that uh, did things like fundraisers, um, providing care packages to send to troops. Uh, so kind of think of them like a forerunner of the USO. Um, 
but a lot of even though the national level for the United States Sanitary Commission is run by men, a lot of the local chapters are, are run and powered by women. Uh, so women organize uh, fundraisers called sanitary fairs um, to to raise money uh, to send supplies uh, to the troops. During the Civil War, a lot of women put aside um, the advocating uh, for women's rights, particularly suffrage or the right to vote uh, for the sake of national unity. But a lot of women gained very valuable experience in fundraising, in networking uh, during the Civil War that they're going to apply to the women's rights movement, particularly the movement to get women the right to vote after the war. And a lot of women are going to, to see uh, their political power um, in the assistance they provide during the war. Uh, as I mentioned, Clara Barton is going to be uh, one of these uh, women who really her wartime experience helps uh, strengthen her commitment uh, to getting women the right to vote and other rights as well to be, make them more equal members of society. So as I mentioned earlier, there's not uh, this happy, sunshiny, rainbows, puppies, kittens uh, reality on the home front. There is a lot of dissent uh, on a couple different fronts. Um, there's a group called the Copperheads who opposed fighting the war and opposition from the group uh, known as the Copperheads mostly clusters in border states. So states right on that boundary between the North and the South, particularly states like, for example, Missouri, which even though they remained in the Union, still had slaves. There were a couple states like that that were right on the, the boundary line that stayed in the Union, but still had slaves. Um, and then the other area that Copperheads are going to be really popular is in cities in the north, particularly among immigrants, because immigrants were subject to the draft, even though they were not U.S. citizens, they were still required uh, to sign up for the draft. And as I mentioned, immigrants were typically the ones hired by rich people as substitutes to go fight in their place. Um, so there's this tension between social classes. The poor are resentful of the fact that the rich can just buy their way um, out of military service. Um, workers are also very frustrated but that these capitalists are making all of this profit off of these government contracts, but aren't doing things like raising worker wages or improving workplace safety because legally they don't have to do those things. Um, so there's going to be a push by workers for better treatment. There's also going to be a lot of tension between uh, races. In particular, working class white people feared that if slavery ended, which after 1863 was looking increasingly likely, that they were now going to have to compete for jobs against newly freed African Americans and that that was going to not only make it harder to find a job, but it's also it was going to drive down wages. And so there's this tension, this economic competition going on uh, between white workers and non white workers. All of this is going to come to the head in one of the deadliest riots of US history, the New York City draft riots, um, which uh, take place in 1863. They last for about four days. More than 100 people die. We don't have an exact body count because I can, as I can tell you as a historian who specializes in studying riots, they're chaotic and complicated and really hard to document. Um, the riots initially start amongst the immigrant working class in New York who are rioting against the draft, but eventually it devolves into violence uh, against anybody they have a, a beef with uh, including draft boards, Republicans, wealthy people, African Americans, um, and it's a, it's a really brutal riot. Okay, so lest you think everybody in the North is gun ho on board for this war, no, that is not emphatically not the case. So let's turn our attention to the war in the South. Now, as I mentioned, there are going to be some similarities um, in how the home front is experienced by both regions, but there are going to be some key differences. 
Um, for one thing in particular, the southern states, in, in attempting to establish this breakaway nation of the Confederate States of America, are going to have some struggles. Um, Jefferson Davis, who is the president of the Confederacy, uh, has a hard time wrangling all of the different states because a Confederate form of government is a loose organization of states. This means that the sort of national or, or unifying level of government doesn't have as much power. This is a reason why we switched from a confederacy, which was our first attempt at government, to a federal government, because then that had a little bit more power and organization, a little bit more unity. So Davis has a very difficult time getting these southern states to agree on anything. Um, he also, uh, is not super great at communicating to people who aren't college educated. Um, he uses lots of big words. He doesn't, he, he doesn't really, he's not a man of the people. He doesn't speak simply. Um, so Davis has a really hard time. And actually um, a lot of people who love speculative history, in other words, asking what if, love to ask the question, what if, the leadership in the North and South have been reversed. What if the South was run by Abraham Lincoln and the North was run by Jefferson Davis? Would the war have ended the way it did? Because Abraham Lincoln was a much more competent uh, leader, political leader than Jefferson Davis, but he's also working with a different political reality. Um, in an attempt to leverage uh, their power over the global economy and get help uh, from other nations, Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy are going to practice what we call King Cotton Diplomacy. Um, remember, your textbook mentioned the United States produced something like 75% of all of the world's cotton supply. So they have a, a near monopoly. And they're, what they're going to try to do is basically say, hey, either you support us in our war effort or we're not going to ship you cotton anymore. Um, they really want Great Britain, which was a huge producer or a huge uh, consumer of Southern cotton uh, to support them. But um, Great Britain didn't want to do that for two reasons. Number one, uh, they also relied very heavily on wheat from northern markets. Number two, when Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation and makes ending slavery formally an outcome of the war, that's going to sway Great Britain to not support the South because Great Britain themselves had actually banned slavery back in the 1830s. Um, so what ends up happening is rather than buckle under the pressure and continue to buy Southern cotton, Great Britain and other consumers of cotton in the global marketplace are going to start to grow it in other places like India and Egypt. Uh, and that's going to have a long term impact on the South because once the South comes out of the Civil War, Southern farmers growing cotton are now competing against uh, farmers on a global market. Um, there's also a blockade of the Union Navy against Southern ports. They do this to limit the ability of uh, Southern uh, cities and the Southern governments from importing products. Remember, the South doesn't have a huge manufacturing economy. They need to import a lot of things like weapons. Um, so that works really, really well um, at weakening the Southern economy. There's also the fact that Union armies openly declare that if any slaves uh, make it to uh, Union uh, army lines, that they will be free, they will not be returned to their masters, and that also weakens slavery by encouraging slaves to run away and rebel against their masters. So these are designed to weaken the Southern economy and the Southern ability to fight. Much like the North, the South also is not unified in fighting this war. The South also has a class problem. The Confederacy does have a draft and like the North allowed uh, people to purchase substitutes to get out of fighting themselves, but the Northern draft also made men exempt, or excuse me, the Southern draft also made men exempt if they lived on a plantation that had 20 or more slaves. Now, this means you're a fairly well-off plantation. And so again, this meant that not only were rich people able to buy substitutes, but some rich people didn't even have to be in the draft at all. So this is gonna, again, 
really anger poor uh, Southern whites who don't have this option to buy their way out of fighting. Um, there's also the fact that that means that those who are drafted into the Confederate Army are poor Southern whites who are not even likely to own slaves and they're fighting a war to preserve rich people's rights to own slaves. And that irony is not lost on them. There's a lot of bitterness there. Uh, there's also the impact of small scale farmers on the Confederate cause. Uh, initially, a lot of these small scale farmers were enthusiastic to uh, fight for what they determined to be Southern liberty uh, or way to live uh, life as they had been accustomed to. However, small scale farms suffer a lot from the war. As I mentioned, most of them did not have any slaves or very few if they did. Um, so that means that they really needed the labor of all of their family members to make the farm successful. And when your dad, your brother, your husband, your son is getting drafted to go fight the war, you're losing valuable labor to run the family farm. There's also the fact that we have rampant inflation. The Confederacy produces a lot of paper currency that becomes essentially worthless. Um, and that wrecks the Southern economy. And Southern farmers oftentimes found themselves um, victims of the government uh, arguing that they had the right to impress or to take their products. So to take their corn or to take their horses and then they paid them, but in essentially worthless Southern paper money. Uh, so a lot of desertion happens during the Civil War because these families left back home on these small farms are writing to the men folk who are fighting and going, we aren't surviving, we're starving, we're having our stuff taken by the government, we're given this worthless money, we need you, come home. So desertion is a huge problem uh, for the Confederate Army with an estimated about 1,000 uh, soldiers leaving their posts and going back home to help their families. Sorry if you hear Sippy snoring in the background. I don't know how sensitive my mic is today. There's also a contingent of people who never supported uh, secession by these Southern states. We call them Southern Unionists, people who sided with the Union in the Civil War. And many Southern states make support of the Union a very serious crime. And again, restrict freedom of speech uh, to prevent people from supporting the Union and the war efforts. There are many secret societies, including one called Heroes of America, which I think feels screams to be made into a comic book, um, who uh, secretly help the Union and aid its war efforts. We also have a series of spies uh, devoted to help the Union war effort, including uh, the most notorious example is Elizabeth Van Lu and Mary Elizabeth Bowser. Uh, Van Lu's family lived in Richmond and Bowser uh, had been a slave in the family household, but had been emancipated or freed uh, before the war. And Bowser, as a freed woman now, gets a position working in the Southern White House. Uh, and so nobody thinks twice about saying sensitive things in front of this black woman. Um, and she ends up passing these secrets along uh, to her former master, Elizabeth Van Lew, who passes them along to the Union. So speaking of women like Van Lew and Bowser, uh, Southern women are crucially important to the war effort. Um, when they don't have support of Southern women is where they're going to start running into problems. They don't have as much in the way of new job opportunities as Northern women do. Uh, as I mentioned, many poor Southern women are kind of stuck supporting their families on these small scale farms in the absence of uh, the men in their family. Lower class women suffered the most because of the dependence on their husband's labor. And many women actually became activists. Many of these women pushed for the government to send money and compensation and aid uh, to help feed their families while their husbands were away at war. And some women rioted. You actually see in this uh, political cartoon on this slide, women are engaging in a bread riot. Uh, 
they're writing for food. Um, women's support and women running homes and businesses is essential for the Southern war effort to survive. But when women struggle, so does the war effort um, because women are writing their, you know, like their uh, men in their family to come home and help them. Uh, they're pushing uh, the Confederate government uh, for help and aid. Um, and so when you lose the support of women, you lose the popular support for the war is essentially what happens in the South. Now, one thing I did want to mention was African-Americans in the Confederacy. As I mentioned, uh, the North widely advertised that any slave who made it to uh, Northern army lines would be freed. Uh, however, there was a discussion within the South about could we offer freedom to slaves if they would fight for the Confederacy? Now, if this sounds weird to you, Remember, this was a similar offer made by the British during the American Revolution that any slave who fought for them uh, would get their freedom. Now, the Confederacy doesn't want to do this, um, in part because they fear arming former slaves with guns, uh, and they feared that this would also further unravel slavery. Because if you won, if the Confederacy won the war, um, then you would have this population of free Africans who were not subject to slavery, and that they thought that would be destabilizing. Uh, eventually, because of a loss of manpower due to desertion and casualties, uh, there is a last minute authorization of this plan uh, to arm African Americans in exchange for freeing them, uh, but it doesn't come through until late March 1865, um, and the war ends in April. Uh, so really, there's no implementation of this plan. Now, where African Americans enter into military service in the Confederacy is as laborers. Uh, there's a lot of use of slaves as hard laborers, um, building uh, forts and positions, uh, transporting supplies, doing things like cooking and cleaning uh, for the troops or going to war with uh, their rich masters and serving kind of as their personal servants. But we don't have any known instances of African Americans actively serving in the Confederate Armed Forces. It's possible that some African Americans who could pass as white uh, served in uniform, but we don't have any evidence to suggest that. So that seems to be a, a pretty widespread myth that some African Americans fought to preserve the Confederacy. The reality is we don't have records of that, and the only records we do have seem to indicate that African Americans were sort of pressed into service against their will uh, in support positions for Confederate forces. All right, so I'm going to pause there. Any questions? on the home front during the Civil War. We're gonna talk about the impact of the Civil War and particularly the constitutional amendments that come out of the Civil War and Reconstruction era next week. So we'll talk more about it then.